I'm going to dedicate the rest of my career to making sure that the workplace works for us, that we don't have to, to leave if we don't want to. We have options and we have choices, and I'm going to use my courage so that others are beneficiaries of that because so many have, that came before us were beneficiaries of their courage. You're listening to the Redefining Wealth Podcast, where we chase purpose, not money. Welcome back. I am your host, Patrice Washington, and I'm so honored to be here with you yet again for a dynamic conversation with brilliant women that I adore. Not always women, but today's episode is another great woman. Minda Hartz and I got together to talk about why it is we normalize trauma in the workplace. Yes. Many of us are living under this idea that we should just be grateful to have a job and we're ignoring the signs and we're ignoring all of the ickiness we feel when we don't feel valued in our workplace environments. And so we're really going to dig in and dig in good. Before I do, make sure you subscribe, rate and review the podcast. It really helps purpose chasers from all over the world find our community. Now, let's get into this week's affirmation. You know, you got to speak positivity into your life, into your day. You got to affirm positivity. You got to affirm abundance. You got to affirm yourself to wealth. This week's affirmation is, I am here to take up space. There is not a space available to me that I should have to cower, hide, dim my light, or diminish myself to fit into. I deserve my seat at the table and will engrave my name on the chair before I allow myself to shrink or get up prematurely because there are people coming behind me that need me to stand my ground. I will be loud, I will be bold, I will be confident, and I will be courageous. I will speak up and never back down, and I will keep my peace no matter who gets uncomfortable with my presence. I am here to take up space, and that's what I intend to do every single day. Welcome to the Redefining Wealth Podcast, Minda. Happy to be here, Patrice. Thank you. I'm so happy to have you here. So in full disclosure, I got to meet Minda Uh, when we were both invited to a mastermind that has been going on for what, like a year, maybe? Yeah, maybe Uh, so. Maybe about a year or so and blown away by this woman's brilliance and everything that you're doing just to really help women in particular thrive in their careers and also acknowledge that they have been through workplace trauma because it's a real thing. So I want to go back to your first book before we get into the book that is coming out right now, right within, I want to go back to the memo. So you made a decision to focus on equity for black and brown women in the workplace. And I just want to know what inspired that path to even feel like this is something that needs to have voice. More people need to understand that this is really going on. Yeah, you know, it's it's crazy that you asked that because I sit sometimes in my room and like, how did we get here, Minda? You know, <laughs> and it's it's those those questions, but really it was a moment in my career where I was just suffering in silence. And I know many of us have probably been in traumatic workplace experiences where you tell yourself, well, this is just how it's gonna be for for you. You're a black woman in the workplace, just be grateful to be here. You know, all of those things don't rock the boat. But I realized, you know what? my counterparts, they're thriving. They're not dealing with these microaggressions. They're not dealing with all these biases. And, you know, obviously no workplace is perfect, but I was experiencing more inequality than others uh, that didn't look like me. And it really started to affect my mental health. It started to affect um, how I saw myself, knowing that I was I was, I belong in these rooms, but I started to question myself after being in those toxic situations. And it really was a breaking point for me, Patrice, where I was crying in my car, like many of us might have 
or you have a closet or wherever you go. And I just said, God, you know, why, why, if I had a different color skin, would I not be experiencing this? You know, not that I wanted that, but I'm like, I know that I wouldn't be dealing with this. Right. And it was Whitney Houston's where do broken hearts go comes on the radio. And I was crying and then I'm laughing. I'm like, God, you have such a sense of humor. And it was in that car uh, crying lashes on the floor, Patrice, you know, every, everything that you could think of. And, and I thought, where do the broken hearts go of women of color when we can't take the workplace anymore? And oftentimes we leave, right? And, and those perpetrators, they get to stay. And I said, you know, I'm going to dedicate the rest of my career to making sure that the workplace works for us, that we don't have to, to leave if we don't want to. We have options and we have choices. And I'm going to use my courage so that others are beneficiaries of that because so many have, that came before us were beneficiaries of their courage. Oh, I'm going to work so the workplace works for us. Like, yes. So Minda, it's interesting. At 40 years old, I never feel like I've been in corporate America. Like I've never had, you know, a job at like a corporate setting. I worked at a nonprofit. So maybe, I don't know, it, it had levels. So maybe that was corporate America. <laughs> and then before I started my first business, I worked for Steve Harvey. And we know that was not a very politically correct work environment, if you can imagine. So I just never feel like I've really worked in corporate America, but yet even in owning my own business, I have experienced those microaggressions. So can you break down what that looks like? Because sometimes I think we normalize our experience and then don't realize that that shouldn't be normal. Like that's not right. What do microaggressions in the workplace look like? That's a great question, Patrice. And I, I would say if you are a black woman or you're a person of color or a woman, you have felt it. You have felt some type of probably microaggression, rather you worked in corporate, you worked for yourself, like you said, or nonprofit. And for example, when uh, my first manager, he happened to be a white man and I came to work with burnt orange fingernail polish on very nice. Um, I was, I loved the color. And he said, Oh, you people love your bright colors. And he went to on to joke for 15 minutes about how black people like bright colors. And in that moment, I, first of all, I couldn't believe that he was going down this path. But number two, I couldn't say anything, right? I felt like I couldn't say anything to him. Like, what do you mean? You know, because then I become the aggressor. And, and I think that's where people start to gaslight you. And, and when you are the only one or one of few, you're like, uh, I better not say anything because they're going to think I'm being the angry black woman and they're just going to say I'm taking it the wrong way. But what way should I take comments like that? Right. So it's those digs that you, you could call them macro, you can call them micro, but they should not be happening. Oh, my gosh. I can't even imagine the one that I've experienced as a woman. And this just happened to me recently in my MBA program. There's a lot of group projects and I was the only woman in a couple of my different teams. So I had different teams for different things. And I was in one team setting where over and over again, the men would talk over me. And, and here's the truth. I know that in terms of background or education or experience that I was actually the senior, right? In that group, in terms of what I've accomplished, it just is what it is. But I was the only person of color and the only woman on the team. And I would literally start to speak and they would just start a whole new conversation. Like what is happening here? And it got to the point where I, I talked to my therapist about it. Like, am I making this a thing? And she's like, oh, okay, see, cause you haven't really been, <laughs> you always say this, but you haven't really been in enough of these settings because you pretty much have the, the luxury of picking and choosing who you're going to be in community with and, or in a, in a workplace environment with. So you haven't experienced this much. And I was blown. And I thought to myself, Minda, is this what women go through every day in these types of environments? What is happening here? Every day, every day, sometimes multiple times a day, right? And, and you figure if you've been dealing with that, especially as Black women, you've been dealing with that for, let's say you had a 15-year career in your former life, 
that's a lot of trauma when you unpack it, right? Being dismissed, um, you know, dignity, respect, that should be table stakes, right? We shouldn't have to like be waving a flag for that. You know, <laughs> that should just be what comes with the territory. But unfortunately, not a lot of people approach work that way. Girl, I, well, I definitely wasn't ready. I definitely wasn't ready. <laughs> you talk about, so let's say you were in a career for five, 10, 15, 20 years. What I see happen is a lot of people come over into entrepreneurship, but they're so damaged by so many of these experiences. So here I am as a business coach going, girl, but you're brilliant. What? Look at you. You were at so-and-so company for 18 years. What do you mean? You can't do this and that. And it clicked for me one day. Some folks have literally been beat up by those experiences. Yes, the resume reads nicely, but we don't know what their daily experience was like in those environments. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the, the part that I'm like, digging deeper into it's like okay so yeah you heard you know somebody mistaking you for the, for the other black woman it wasn't you they called you the wrong name but all of that it's just like going to the doctor patrice you know they ask you what is your pain level and you say okay 10 is excruciating one is like oh it doesn't hurt but you get enough threes at work right you get enough fours at work and it feels like you're a 10 and any pain right is uncomfortable and, and it starts to affect how you see yourself and after a while you like oh that three it's okay that's just jim being jim right when in reality we know that jim should not be talking to you that way you know when you're being mistreated right but then we start to question ourselves and that's what um, toxicity is meant to do, make you question, make you wonder what you're doing wrong. And, and as Black women, as women in general, we can't afford to lean into that mentality because that affects us. That's why healing is for us, right? It's not for them, it's for us. So like you said, um, we start to, people say, bring your authentic self to work. But when you've been in an, an authentically toxic environment, majority of your career, you don't even know who you are anymore because of those experiences at times. Oh, that's so good. And I often wonder too about when you hear, well, bring your authentic self to work. Look at how Black women have been scrutinized for hair choices for mm -hmm. so many years. Do you know that there were many years of my career that I was afraid to wear braids or anything like braids, anything that resembled natural hair to speak or to do anything because I had a former mentor that would tell me that's not professional. And I, oh my gosh, I could tell you stories, girl, about the things <laughs> I used to do, the hoops I used to jump through to, I got a call to do something. I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to go take my hair down. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was from a black mentor. So it's not only what's coming from non people of color, it's how it even gets ingrained in us and how we kind of perpetuate these thoughts and ideas on others. Did you ever have any experiences related to that? Or I'm sure you hear about it all the time in your work. I, I wanted to get like my uh, tambourine and be like, yes, girl, amen. Because <laughs> I had that feeling too for, for the longest time. And I still am unlearning showing up, right? You know, um, I remember my last year of, of my, my former life and I had gone on vacation and I had my black girl braids. And I remember staying up till like, or thinking about, okay, I got to stay up till like two o'clock in the morning to take these out because I can't show up to the meeting on Monday with these in my hair. And you know what? I sat back, Patrice, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to do it. I've been doing this countless, countless, countless if they say bring your authentic self to work, this is who I am. This is part of me. And if you have a problem with me showing up, then we'll deal with it tomorrow. But for the first time in my life, I let go of that double consciousness, right? How people see us, um, how we see ourselves through the eyes of other people. And so I showed up to that meeting. It was in my head, like, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? And they did comment on it. But, you know, I had held my head high and I said, this is what it is. And I didn't have to stress myself out or be tired in the morning. <laughs> I had my hair done and we were good. But I think um, there was a time that I would have never done that because of, you know, what my elders would tell me, girl, you can't show up. You're going to a meeting like that. And that gets inside of our mind too. So when you're getting it from all angles, uh, again, you're, you start to question how you show up, what you say, what you think. And, and, and we don't get a chance to just be, and I think that's the part of it. Uh, 
what would you, if you gave yourself permission to be who you need to be, what would that look like? Oh, that's so good. That's so good. A chance to just be. So in your new book, In Right Within, How to Heal from Racial Trauma in the Workplace, I feel like in the memo you brought up a lot of like, hey, this is what's going on. But in Right Within, it's like, it's time for healing. So how are we going to start healing some of these things? What are the themes um, that you really cover in the book? Yeah, it's interesting because I thought that and maybe you felt this way as being an author, um, but I wrote the memo and I'm like, OK, that's all I have to say. Right. I don't think I have anything else on the matter. But what I realized was every time I received like an email from a woman or I'm you know, out speaking, people were still dealing with that trauma, even if the experience had happened 10 years ago, five minutes ago, whatever it was, it still hurt like it ha- like it's constantly happening. And I thought about my experiences and there's certain things that still like tear me up if I think about it. Right. And I'm like, you know what? We got some healing to do. And I thought about my, you know, people say, oh, you, you're so confident. You're so here. I said, but this it's take, it took a lot of work and I'm still healing. It, it, I'm not completely healed, but I'm still healing. And that took faith in God, you know, getting down on my knees and getting on the couch, you know, of a a therapist, you know, in a sense. So I use my tools to say, okay, if, if Jim, if Keisha, if they don't do right by me, I got to do right by myself. And even though these experiences have caused me pain, I don't have to hold on to the trauma that I shouldn't have never had in the first place. And I think that as black and brown women, we can be free. And that's what I want us to get to a state of freedom. And and many of our ancestors died not knowing what freedom really felt like. And I don't, I want that for us. I love that. And I love that you mentioned um, both faith and therapy, because I think that we need to be honest about the fact that for many of us, it's going to take a mixture of the two. It's not just, well, I'm going to pray about it and then get no practical earthly tools to actually help Mm -hmm. us. And for those of us who did grow up as believers or we identify with some type of spiritual practice, it may not be enough to just go to therapy and then not have a way for you to move through this resistance and this trauma in a more spiritual sense, understanding that maybe this didn't happen to me. It happened for me. That's what we say at the faith pillar here at redefining wealth. It's like, okay, how do I look at this situation, no matter how negative and fight to find the lesson or the blessing in it. And that comes from a faith practice, not necessarily what you work out with your therapist. Right. But both of those things have a place. And we love saying here, and it's not my original quote. I've been trying to let everybody know it's not my original quote, but I talk so much that people think it is. Um, that our, our finances, our career, our workplace situations are only going to grow to the extent we're willing to heal. And I believe invest in that healing, be intentional about that healing. And I love what you talk about in the book, because one of the things you mentioned is having to reframe past career disappointments, right? Reframe past career disappointments. So essentially I'm thinking not living in the past, but what does that mean? Like at its core? I'm glad you bring that up because for so long, while I was trying to figure out what healing looked like and meant for me, um, I used to make it about this one particular person that caused me all the problems <laughs> and, and work. All I could do was focus on what they did to me, right? And then I realized that I get to redefine my success. I get to rewrite my own narrative and that my story didn't just stop with that trauma. My story actually began when I decided I wanted to heal from the trauma that was inflicted upon me. And when I was able to say, hey, I'm ready to heal and let go and at some point for, forgive, right? <laughs> forgive this person, I it opened up a whole new world for me, right? I was able to be vulnerable. I was able to share. And then so many other women, you know, <laughs> I sometimes say that my my freedom help unlock somebody else's, right? You know, so I think about had I stayed silent, somebody else might not have gotten free, right? And I was able to get free because of, you know, those who've come before me and, and hearing those things. And and healing isn't a one-time event. Healing is a lifestyle. And that's what I've owned, right? Okay, yes, that happened to me, but my story is still being written and I get to take that back. So I don't have mm-hmm. to hold on to, to that. And so for me, it's really, yes, those bad things happen, but we don't have to stay in the pain. 
I'm sorry, I had to break out a pen so I could write down that healing isn't a one-time event. (laughs) Healing is not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle and it's a choice. Mm -hmm. It's a, because what you said is you were like, okay, I got to heal. Like I have to heal and move on and create a new path. It's a choice when you're so in it though, Minda, and you're so inundated by it. And it's all you think and see and breathe and sleep every day. How do you finally just choose healing? Yeah. You know, it's, it's so interesting because you're right. Healing is a choice. That's the choice we all have, right? We have that as believers. We have that as entrepreneurs. We have that as, you know, um, salaried employees. We get to choose how this, how the story continues on, right? We get to fixate. And you know what? We're, while we're fixating, the person that caused the harm, they're off posting another cat picture. They're off, you know, in, <laughs> in Tulum, you know, living their best life, not thinking about us, right? I, um, and so for me, I'm like, you know what? I want to, my life is not going to be centered around these traumas. And that's when I decided that I wanted more, right? Um, the, the Bible says, you know, I know the plans I have for you. And I realized that, okay, that happened to me, but that's not the plan God has for me, right? And I have to decide if I want to move forward <laughs> so that I can get to the plan. And, and that's where I was like, you know what? I've stayed in this hurt, in this trauma. I know what that feels like. I know what that pain feels like. And I don't want to be bitter. And I don't want that to affect how I show up in my other areas of life. Because again, healing isn't always just for us, but all that trauma, I go home to your, you go home to your partner, you go home to your family, you know, they get that from you. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to be transferring that negative energy or that trauma um, because that affects all other aspects of my life. And so that's when I realized holistically, my life depended on healing. Oh, my life depended on healing. You know, every conversation that we've been having this season has been so holistic and it's been just the perfect illustration of redefining wealth. The fact that everything impacts something else in our lives. Your life does not just operate in these little silos, right? If you are unfulfilled at work, that does spill over into your relationships. That does impact your view of your faith. That does you know, impact your environment and your like so many other things. And so it's so important to really invest in that healing and pursue that healing at all costs. Minda, we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back because I I have more questions for you, girl. When I started podcasting, I had nothing, no fancy equipment, no cover art, no theme music. I just had this burning desire that I was supposed to use my purpose of helping people redefine wealth in the podcasting space. And so with some intentional planning, I launched what became the Redefining Wealth podcast in just three weeks. That was four years ago. And today the Redefining Wealth podcast has over 9 million downloads. We've interviewed everyone from celebrities to entertainers to authors and thought leaders. We've been featured everywhere from Success Magazine to Cosmopolitan and even Good Morning America. Now, why do I share all that? Because I'm not special. The truth is this started with leaning into my purpose and being willing to use my voice in a powerful way. And I bet that there's something that's calling you as well, something that you need to use your voice to amplify in the marketplace. So I wanna help you do that. If you're finally ready to use your voice and launch a podcast that aligns with your purpose, I wanna invite you to check out my intentional online training, Podcast with Purpose. You can find out more details at podcastwithpatrice.com. That's podcastwithpatrice.com. Your purpose deserves to be amplified and I wanna help you do that. As Minda and I were talking, I really started thinking about how many times in my career I feel like I have experienced these microaggressions. And even though I haven't considered myself to be someone like in corporate America, as an entrepreneur, I've definitely seen it over and over again. And one place in particular that really stands out to me is one time I was speaking at this conference 
it was a big deal. I mean, there were big names on the lineup. They brought out the best of the best. It was first class everything, right? Thousands of attendees. And I was feeling really good to be there. But I will admit that I was one of only a few women and I was one of only a few people of color. And I was the only black woman on the entire lineup. And I will never forget getting to the end of that talk and really feeling like, man, I did my thing, right? People of all colors, all ages, all backgrounds coming up to me and telling me what their takeaways were. And that is the thing that fulfills me the most about speaking. But I also wondered how many, if, how many of my counterparts heard different quote unquote compliments like, you're so eloquent. You speak so well. You're so articulate. Well, this conference in particular literally brought out the best of the best in the speaking industry. They really brought heavy hitters to take that stage. And I don't know why it would be such a surprise that I was intelligent or articulate or that I speak well. I really feel like, you know, every time that happens to me, those are the, the moments of microaggression. Those are the little jabs that are like, hmm, what is this? It, it always feels like a backhanded compliment. And so there are so many different ways for us to experience this stuff in the workplace. You may not have a traditional workplace setting either, but if we're honest, it comes up. And so in the moment, do I always do a good job of correcting people or asking them what do they mean by that? No, I don't. I don't. I think I'm still always so shocked that it even happens. But as I was having the conversation with Minda and she talked about, you know, do my white counterparts experience this? Like, do my male counterparts actually experience this or are they allowed to just come in and thrive? It made me think of that particular event and did the fellas on the ticket were people coming up to them and saying things like, wow, you're so articulate. Or the other women who were white women on the ticket, were they saying, wow, you speak so well. It's those things that we have to look out for. And the people who came up to me, and there were a great number who said things like that. That's why I remember being so kind of weirded out or overwhelmed by the number of people who said things like that. I don't think they meant any true harm. I really don't. Um, I think that their intentions were pure. I just don't know if we're always aware of how that actually lands and what that insinuates and how that makes the receiver feel. So not above it. <laughs> Still not above it. I still get things like that here and there. Um, so if you're out there and you're just getting started in your entrepreneurial journey and your career, um, or you've been it in a long time and you're starting to recognize this isn't normal. Um, I want you know you to be encouraged that you're not alone. You're not the first. You're not the last. You're not alone. And also join me um, as I join Minda in standing up more so that people are more aware that that type of behavior and those type of backhanded compliments and microaggressions are just not good enough. We have to start to call it out and let people know that it's unacceptable. And so I'm saying this publicly so I could be held accountable and, you know, in your particular lane or space or industry, I hope that you'll join us in becoming more accountable because there's someone coming up behind us that we have to change this for might not be my daughter or my niece, but maybe it's your daughter or niece that I'm willing to stand in the gap for. Um, and I hope that you will do that for my daughter and nieces and for the people coming up behind you. So Minda, before the break, we were talking about healing. And before you get to the place of healing, or maybe while you are committed to this idea of healing, so you're really leaning into your faith and maybe you're in therapy trying to work through all of this, 
how do we prevent ourselves from constantly though being re-triggered because we may be in the same workplace with the same people who sent us down this path in the first place how is the only option to leave how do we advocate for ourselves if we're in that environment right now yes um i'm glad you bring that up because that was part of a really big portion of me writing right within is like okay you can leave the job right but you might encounter the same type of personalities ideologies and behaviors And while you were healing, now you're on a potential relapse because the same language or because we've been so harmed in the workplace that we move into our new job and it may not even be a toxic environment, but we're so triggered because it feels something reminds us of what happened, right? So it's really important that first we address the pain to say, hey, this has happened to me. Um, And I think a lot of times, often, Patrice, we don't even want to say that, call a thing a thing, right? And so for me, it took a long time for me to say that I was harmed, right? Uh, And so I think that's the first step, saying it, but then also creating your tools. You know, success is not a solo sport. You go into another environment, what tools do you have so that you don't relapse, right? And again, healing is for us, not for them. So when someone does call you angry or docile or feisty, that you're like, okay, I have a choice. Maybe my choice is gonna have a conversation with them, right? To let them know what good looks like for me, and I think oftentimes a lot of people don't change their behavior because we haven't told them what good looks like. And so talking about those difficult conversations, which it's hard, but people, just like any relationship, if you're booed up and they keep doing something to you, they're not gonna know that that's not making you happy. That's not your love language, right? So what is it that you need to tell Kim so that she's aware that, no, I'm, sis, we not, we're not gonna have that kind of conversation here today. <laughs> No, no, sis. This ain't what you want. This ain't what you want. Wait a minute. Okay. (laughs) Look, I remember way back pre COVID days when I would be on stage and I would say, some of you pull into the, pull into the parking lot at your job, (laughs) punching your fist. Like if this, if she say something to me today, if Kim try me today, I'm going to let her know this is not what she wants. And that's that's exactly it. But Kim doesn't know what's good for you, right? Right. So to that point, going back to some of the guys from my MBA program, I talked to my therapist about it. And my therapist said, well, what did you tell him? And I said, after like the second or third time, I was like, am I on mute? So I became (laughs) passive aggressive, right? I'm like, oh, maybe I'm on mute. Maybe you didn't hear me speaking. He's like, oh, 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 sorry about that. But then the behavior continued with the next group meeting. And my therapist was like, okay, well, what was going on that you weren't comfortable to pull, you know, Brad to the side and say, Brad, hey, this is what you're doing. And I'm not good with that. This is how I prefer to be treated. And I was like, whoa. And you guys, I'm talking, this happened recently. And I was like, whoa, okay. So I fell into a passive aggressive, like behavior. That's not my normal tendency. Instead of just like, okay, I'm going to need to have a conversation with him. And one of the things that came up for me, Minda, is I was like, am I going to be angry black woman? Am I going to be? And I, I didn't realize it until my therapist started asking me the, the line of questioning. And I'm like, as one of two black women in this particular class, I'm like, okay, am I going to look like I'm doing the most? Am I being extra? Do I make it about being a woman? But I know I didn't see him over talk the other guys, you know, I'm like, well, do I make it about being a black woman where I had all of these things and nobody on that team is paying me to do a thing. I can't imagine what that is like inside of a space where your livelihood could be impacted by the conversation you choose to have. That And it's that part, right? Um, And I think that just as you had mentioned, um, oftentimes we don't say something because we don't want to be perceived as angry Black women, right? But again, that's part of the trauma that somebody else, how they view us, so we silence ourselves. And we've been silenced for so long that nobody knows that we don't like it when you call me Mindy. It's actually Minda, right? (laughs) You know, like, and we tell ourselves, oh, I know what he means, but you keep but no, they don't see you and respect you. And and it's not like that Nene leaks meme. Like I said, what I said, it's not 
what you said, it's how you say it. Right? So, but, and, and if they take it the wrong way, then that's on them. And I talk about that in the book, like, don't put someone else's feelings above your own, right? You don't have to be nasty. You don't have to be mean, but what would it look like? You know, Brene Brown says clarity is kindness. Let somebody know, be clear with what is acceptable and what's not. Hey, Brad, I know you might not have meant it, but actually every time we're on the Zoom call, you're always cutting me off. I know you might not have meant to do it, but I want to make you aware of it. Glad we could have this conversation. Give them the benefit of the doubt, right? But if we never have, we never engage, then people never know what is okay with us. And that's just like any type of relationship. And Audrey Lord, she says, beware of feeling you're not good enough to deserve it. Are you, you're paying good money to be in the program. Do you not deserve to be able to speak up just like Brad, right? And, and nobody's looking at him like, crazy white guy, right? You know, they're just allowing him to talk. And so I think that that's going back to redefining success for us. Let's yeah. normalize black women being able to say what they need to say. Oh, so good. It, it's amazing the stories that we can concoct. And I think sometimes, you know, I don't remember a time when I was actually accused of being an angry black woman, but for some reason I carry such a fear of it right? And it's, it's this right. trauma that has been passed down intergenerationally. It's been passed down through media. Maybe you've heard a girlfriend's story and you've internalized that to become your story. And now you're literally living from that place. Because like you said, no one is like, look at crazy Brad talking again, right? So why would I create the narrative that if I speak up for myself, which is so, and, and I'm an accomplished woman, I have yes. a strong voice. I use my voice every day in some way to impact tens of thousands of people. And yet I'm on this Zoom call with Brad sitting here <laughs> like, if he talk over me one more time, like being so pressed about it. It's like, Patrice, where's your voice? And I share this to say transparently, it's, this is not above any of us. Like, no. this is not about, oh, well, you hold such a title and you're in this role and you're in this position and it only happens to people at this level. I'm sure from your work, you can tell us you've seen this from women and women of color at every, like on, on every part of the spectrum. Every from 19 to 85, I probably have heard from somebody who's, you know, still experienced and we all do it. Right. But it's to this point, let's, what are we leaving the next generation? Are we leaving them to silence their voice? Because to your point, Patrice, no one has, if I take a hard thought about it, no one's ever called me an angry black woman, but I'm fearful every time I show up that I'm not her, right? You know, and who created that narrative? A dominant majority about people they haven't even gotten a chance to get to know in, in many cases, right? And then we hold on to that and we can't do our best work because we're walking on eggshells all day, you know? And it's like, okay, what would, we know what that feels like. So what would it feel like to do it a little bit different, right? And healing is individual. It's not prescriptive, but part of healing is, you know, I used to tell myself that I don't have a voice. That's why I can't say anything, right? But I had to redefine my narrative. It's actually, I do have a voice, I have to decide how I want to use it, right? And how do I want to have the conversation? And am I engaging with Brad so that we find a solution or am I engaging with Brad so that he knows I'm not the one today? And I, <laughs> and I had to look at it and say, okay, how do we get to a solution? How do I have this conversation when Brad actually sees me? And even if he doesn't agree with it, I divorce myself from whatever feelings he has. He can go sit with it but now I've centered myself and that's part of the healing. And because we're not used to doing it, it takes some time, right? But we, we got to start today. So Minda, at what point does the healing though involve the actual workplace? So not Brad and I, but the fact <laughs> that this culture has allowed Brad to thrive in me to be silenced, even though we both came in brilliant at what we need to do. What can we start to do to address our workplace environments, the culture? What do we do? Where do we start? Yeah, <clears throat> it's actually uh, two-sided. So as black and brown women, as women, as you know, anybody who's been triggered or traumatized inside the workplace, we have to figure out what, 
what does it look like to be our authentic self and who do we need to be for ourselves? But then on the other side, so we can do that work right through church, through therapy, through, you know, group coaching, whatever it is you decide to do working out. But then we also have to hold our leaders and managers accountable for creating a space in which we want to stay, right? You mentioned something earlier, Patrice, that a lot of Black women in particular are leaving corporate America or a nonprofit and they're starting their own businesses. It actually makes me sad because many of us were forced into entrepreneurship, wasn't a choice, right? And so, you know, we often talk about creating your own table, but many of us, including myself, created a table because the one I was at wasn't working out, but I really enjoyed my job. I was good at it, right? So what are we going to do to make sure that the workplace doesn't push out black and brown women and then brands of the world get to stay, right? And keep harming other people. And so part of the book too is talking about managers. I feel like managers have a unique opportunity to set the tone and make sure that Brad isn't continuing to be able to be Brad if it's harming other people. So what has to happen uh, so that we don't normalize that behavior? And so Brad says, you know what, maybe I don't like working here no more because I can't, I can't say the things I used to say. Great, because it's not an option for equity. <laughs> it's mandatory. Yeah. Oh, that is so good. And you saw me chuckling, Minda, because I was like, Lord, if there is a Brad or a woman married <laughs> to a Brad listening to this podcast, I that was the first name that came to mind. If your <laughs> name is Brad and you listen to Redefining Wealth, I want you to know that we love you. We um, love you, Brad. <laughs> but we need it. We love you, Brad. We needed an example name, though. We we needed an example <laughs> name. No, that that's so true. We're so uncomfortable and yet folks doing the harm are right at home. Just happy sure. as a lark, just <laughs> moving about gay as could be right. Just as happy as they want to be. And it's like, we are moving out. And that means we are taking the opportunity to, first of all, just be someone that those coming behind us could see in these positions, but also the grace and the opportunity we could extend to others somehow because of our presence in the workplace. I said this in an earlier episode in this series, I was talking about the number of women who have been such a blessing to me in different organizations when it came to brand partnerships or speaking opportunities. And I believe that they were overwhelmingly the reason that I got those opportunities well before people knew me as who they know me as today, when I didn't have some long, you know, resume that read like a rap sheet of all these accomplishments. There were people who were like, I see something in her, but more than often they were women. And then deeper than that, they were women of color. And if they would have been run out of those environments, and I'm sure several of them I learned later, they definitely uh, were going through a lot in those environments, but some of them stuck it out to create opportunities for people like me. And if everyone please, who is there? And that's not to say that you need to stay in a toxic place and suffer to help out other folks. I'm not saying that, mm -hmm. but I definitely think there's great cause to stay and speak up um, because beyond just your job, it's, it's, it represents so much more than you just doing that job. Absolutely. And I think now we're in a unique time period where we can speak a little more candidly than we have been able to in years before. So if you don't feel like you could do it now, I don't know when to tell you it's the right time because now that racial equity is on the table, this is where we have to activate our voices because <clears throat> I don't know how long it lasts, but at least people will know, let's normalize it lasting forever. Let's make it last forever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, and and, but it starts with us, right? You know, I just think about the next generation of black and brown women that will enter in the workforce. And I often think, Patrice, of, the, of my manager who said, you people love your bright colors and all that stuff. And I think, man, if I would have said something, maybe he wouldn't say that to the next black woman because he thinks that's okay, right? And I know that we can't solve all the problems. We can't speak up every single time, but I realized, you know what, if it bothers me enough, even if it's a few days after for my healing, I need to have a conversation because I don't want him thinking that this type of language is okay. Right. And making me uncomfortable. And so again, it takes a lot of unlearning to start to center yourself. It does. And speaking of which 
I wanted to talk to you about young people because I know you have a book coming out this year, but you got another book. You have another project that you're working on and it centers around young adults and, and young people. And as you know, my daughter Reagan oh, just started high school this year. And I want to teach her early how to recognize a young Brad and learn <laughs> to speak up. Because when I really think about it, there are times that I did keep quiet, even in college, where I was, um, you know, I was in the presence of people who had Brad spirit. And I didn't learn then. And, and I went to a predominantly white institution. So I definitely already felt outnumbered in the business school there, right? So I didn't speak up there. And so these little instances, which are actually bigger instances, it's like you said, getting level three paying cuts throughout your life, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want my daughter to have that same experience, but the Brad spirit is there. I don't know if people think, oh, when, when everything, you know, the next generation will have it better. Actually, here we are. Like, I thought that this generation would be much better. And yet we'll, we're hearing and seeing so many of these stories that sound like their stories straight out of the sixties. Mm -hmm. So how do we start to equip our young women and our black and brown young women in particular to advocate for themselves early and, and hopefully start shutting down Brad's spirit so he does better by the time he's in corporate America too. Like, how do we start young? Yeah, you know, so the, the next book is called You Are More Than Magic. I know we always talk about, oh, black girl magic, but we're actually so much more than that. And I started to think about uh, little Minda, right? And I'm like, wait a second, where did this silencing come from? And to your point, it was in grade school, it was in junior high school, it was in all the way up, right? And I'm like, ooh, I didn't think I could say something when someone called me this at, in elementary school, right? Or the kids made fun of my hair when I had beads, you know, all of these things. So I didn't want to, I wanted to shy away. Oh, they hate beads. I can never wear beads again, right? And again, I'm putting myself in these boxes from an early age and I started to think about it. I'm like, actually, I, I called the one of my perpetrators, Carrie, in the memo and I said, you know, it actually wasn't, it was the little Carries that got to grow up to be the bullies in the workplace. But we have to start and deal, address with the difficult conversations um, and have the spirit and the encouraging spirit for us, for our young girls and our young kings to be able to say, actually, little Brad, that this is not okay, you know, and having the tools, but also how do we have the tools to talk with our parents, our guardians, right? Because that too, if we're being silenced in our homes and then we're being silenced at school, that starts to for help form who we become in, in many cases. So I really talk to young adults, but I also talk to the parents about how do we have these good conversation and foster using your voice in a productive way? You know, like when we were growing up, I would probably say, you know, Sometimes your parents would say, you know, stay out of grown folks business, go up in the room, you know, all those sorts of things. I know they meant well when they said it, but if you hear enough of that, then it sometimes shapes how you show up in different spaces. And, and I really start to tackle some of those things. You know, imagine how confusing on one instance, it's like you need to be seen and not heard. And then on the other side, they're like, speak up, speak up when I'm talking. It's like, what do you want me to do? Be quiet, speak up. <laughs> I got talks too much on my report card. That was a bad thing. It's too much. Now you want me to use my voice. It is. And I've, I've really tried to be intentional with Reagan to really encourage her to embrace her feelings and, and use her voice. And sometimes that means that as a mom, I just sit there and not, not because, and not because she's being disrespectful, but I have to let her say how she genuinely and authentically feels. And I need to be able to validate her feelings and still, you know, maintain our boundaries of mother right. and daughter. Cause you know, I'm still, I'm still not your little friend, but I am a <laughs> respecter. I am a respecter of your feelings. This is so good, Minda. I'm so incredibly proud of you. Before I let you go, I have to ask you what we call redefining wealth, rapid wisdom question. So you're just going to tell us the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Okay. All right. How do you define success? By my own terms. Love it. How do you define wealth in three words or less? Freedom, peace, generosity. Yes. Okay. What's one book that has helped you redefine wealth for yourself? 
actually say the Bible tithing. I, I know it's rapid, so I can't get into it, but <laughs> no, no, you can elaborate. Just give us a little bit right there. Yeah. You know, um, I grew up in church, but I didn't realize the principles behind giving, reaping and sowing. And, you know, no matter what I'm doing, I'm all, tithing is it. That's table stakes. Like got to do it no matter how else I might be living. Tithing is most important to me. And I feel like that has been the foundation of, of my, of my wealth. Yes. I completely understand, agree, relate. And I remember being on my brother's couch in late 2009, my husband was still in new Orleans. I was in Atlanta and he would send us like a hundred, 150 bucks from his paycheck. And I would tithe that 10 or $15. And I remember my brother would be like, what is wrong with you? Why are you giving those people your money? And I'm like, it's not about giving those people like, like you said, table stakes, this is foundational. Like, and it, and needless to say, here we are. And I, I do believe that that has had a lot to do um, with me learning how to make choices from a place of faith and not mm-hmm. fear and right. not from a scarcity mindset. So, so good. Okay. Here's the last one. You're going to fill in the blank. My name is, and to me, the truth about wealth is being generous. You got to say the whole line. See how people, you know, don't follow directions. You got to say the whole thing. My oh, name okay. is. <laughs> oh, wait, say it again. <laughs> See, my you're, name the, you're is... the brand strategist. I, I, I'm still, I need my cue cards. <laughs> my name is Minda Hart. And the truth about wealth is. there, And then fill in the blank. My name is Minda Hartz, and the truth about wealth is being generous. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome. This was so good. I know there's so many people that need safe spaces to have these conversations. And I know that you have a show, Seat at the Table, on LinkedIn. And I have to give you a shout out, a proper shout out, um, because I know that you were named the number one top voice for equity in the workplace by LinkedIn. Congratulations and keep creating this safe space for, for us to so have much. these conversations. So amazing. Today's Ask Patrice Anything comes from my girl, Julia, in Chicago. Hello, Patrice, queen purpose chaser. My question is, how do you protect your heart, yourself, and your family with having to be um, in the public eye? Thank you. Julia, that is such a great question. You know, I have to be honest, initially, when I got into this space and my career started to grow, I was very nervous about sharing my family, you know, behind the scenes things, anything about my real life. I'm I'm actually more of a private person than people probably realize. Um, it's only in the last few years that I've started to open up more. And a part of that was trying to protect my family and protect my own peace and protect my energy. Um, I think at this point, I'm at a space where I'm still very selective about what I share. I think there's a misperception or misconception that when you are quote unquote in the public eye, that everything is, you know, permissible, like everything goes, you, you have to share in order to be relevant. I don't really subscribe to that. I share the things that I feel comfortable sharing in the moments that I feel comfortable doing it. You know, Um, oftentimes the things that I'm sharing are so far removed. They're not really real time. They could be days or even weeks after the moment has actually passed because in the moment, the way that I protect my peace and my energy and my family is to be present there, not to be in this space where I have to share it on social media. Earlier this year, it's interesting, during my husband's birthday, it was my husband, my bonus children, my daughter's birthday, and I really didn't post anything. I didn't post about anyone. And someone made a comment about, you know, 
the state of my, I guess, family life or marriage because I hadn't said anything. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, the fact that people think that, you know, if you post, then it's real. It's like, no, real life is actually still happening. And that's what I'm really present to. Um, and so nevertheless, I would say be selective, be choosy about what you share, when you share, with whom you share, and just do what feels good for you. I don't do it to be relevant, quote unquote. I don't do it for the algorithms and the logistics of it all. I do what feels right in my spirit and my heart at that time. And if it doesn't, I don't force myself to do anything. And that's how I've come to protect more of my energy and my peace and my family in the process. Such a great question. All right, that's it for this week's episode. Listen, make sure you support my girl Minda Hearts. Pick up a copy of Right Within. If you or someone you love have been experiencing some workplace trauma and you want to heal, especially if you've experienced it and you're going out into the world to do other things, right? You definitely want to make sure that you're not just lugging that baggage from place to place. You definitely want to do the work to heal. So pick up a copy. Listen, let Minda Hearts know that you found her here on the Redefining Wealth podcast. Come into our free community, the Redefining Wealth group on Facebook, and let's talk about your workplace trauma. What have you experienced and what are you committing to doing now that you have some tools and some ideas, some new thoughts percolating there? And that's it for us. Until next time, I want you to go live your life's purpose, find fulfillment, and earn more without ever chasing money. Talk to you later. Thank you.